Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. Those were published in the 2000s. Is this supposed to be the 1950s? I mean, if you're going to be lazy, don't do a close-up. Hello, beautiful bookworms, and welcome back to Squirrel's Bookshelf. I'm Jess, head squirrel. If you're new to my channel, a little bit about myself. By day, I am the manager of a secondhand and antiquarian bookshop just outside the Cotswolds in the UK. And this channel right here is essentially my outlet for all things nerdy and bookish. I am by no means an expert on every nuance of the book trade. In fact, one of my favorite things about the job is the opportunity to continually learn and grow in a variety of subjects. That said, I certainly have learned a lot since I joined the book trade, to the extent that I now frequently notice books in films and television shows, whether especially featured or just sort of hanging out in the background as set decoration, and proceed to annoy my husband by rattling off useless facts about the books or pointing out what's wrong with them. So today I thought I would expose my nerd brain to you, my YouTube audience, and react to some films and series featuring books and discuss the historical accuracy of the books within the context of the story and the time period. Let's start with one of my nostalgic childhood go-tos, Hook. Hook is a live-action sequel to Peter Pan in which Peter, played by Robin Williams, is now a grown-up who has forgotten who he once was and has to remember his childhood self in order to rescue his kids who have been kidnapped by Captain Hook. So in the film, Granny Wendy, played by Maggie Smith, reads from her personal copy of Peter Pan to Peter's children, explaining that Mr. Barry was Sir James. Our neighbor, he loved our stories so much that he wrote them all down in a book. We see this copy twice in the film, once when Wendy is reading to Maggie, and once when she's trying to convince Peter of his past self. Hand me my book. So here we get a brief glance of the book itself, which I'm pleased to say looks like a first edition. The novel was first published in 1911 by Hodder and Stoughton under the name Peter and Wendy. I happen to have an early reprint from the same year in the same binding, so you can see it's green cloth with a gilt decoration on the front and on the spine. Side note, the first US edition was also published in 1911 by Charles Scribner's Sons, and it has the same appearance. But to collectors, there's this rule called follow the flag. J.M. Barry was British, so it's the British edition that's considered the true first edition, even though the US edition was published in the same year. In any case, I love that they made the effort of using a first edition, even though it barely gets featured in the film, because it makes sense with Wendy's story of Barry getting his ideas from her stories. Within this fictional storyline, of course, he would have given them one of the first copies of the book. Peter, don't you know who you are? There it is again. Now, what is not correct are the color illustrations. There was no color inside the first edition, only black and white illustrations by F.D. Bedford. There was the frontispiece here, the title page, and 11 illustrations throughout the text, but none of them are in color. I just did a quick search for that image of Peter, but it seems to be unique to the film. As far as I can tell, the same goes for this illustration of Wendy. I think it's pretty clear they just added these to the prop book in the film. I must admit though, they made them look convincing. The way the illustrations are pasted onto that dark colored paper with a tissue guard over the top, that's, that's very true to the era of publishing, just not this specific book. One last detail, which isn't necessarily inaccurate, but a fun fact. The first edition of Peter and Wendy had a dust jacket. A dust jacket is that piece of paper that's wrapped around the book to protect it, and usually nowadays features some cover art, a synopsis or reviews, and an ISBN number or a barcode or something like that. Now, dust jackets didn't really become a thing until the 1920s, at least not as far as being collectible and desirable of their own accord. The Great Gatsby's dust jacket iconically being one of the first to change the game on that front. But books before that time period still sometimes had some sort of protection around the book, just so the customer could get it home safely without the book being damaged. These sorts of dust jackets were usually quite plain with perhaps a bit of text, the price, and or other works from that publisher, but nothing fancy. 
The dust jacket for Peter and Wendy is quite a special one given that it was published in 1911 in that it did have some decorativeness to it. Here is an example from my bookshop. We've got the dust jacket protected at the moment, but I'll take it out so I can show you. In fact, the dust jacket copies the decorative gilt tooling on the front cover and spine. Now, extant copies of this dust jacket are so rare that they're worth considerably more than the book itself and can easily bring a copy's value into the four figures, if not more. So the fact that Wendy's copy in the film doesn't have the dust jacket doesn't necessarily make it inaccurate. Because as I mentioned around this time, the dust jacket just wasn't something people generally held on to. Once the book arrived safely home from the bookshop, the dust jacket had served its purpose and was generally discarded. So we'll say that's what Wendy did, I suppose. Unfortunately. But overall, aside from the addition of the colored illustrations, this all looks spot on. 9 out of 10. All right, next up is The Man Who Invented Christmas. This is a dramatized account of the six weeks in Charles Dickens' life in which he wrote A Christmas Carol. If you haven't seen it already, I gave a brief history of A Christmas Carol in a previous video in which I discussed classic Christmas films and the books that inspired them. But here I'm going right to the end of the film when Charles Dickens is finally handed a copy of his new book. Come on, man, don't pull on me, Agony. Okay? Well, we've got some good things going on here. The first edition was bound in red cloth. The gilt title and decoration is all correct, as is the blind decorative border to the front cover. But holy cow, that book is huge. It looks about the size of like a modern 300 page hardback. Look how thick the spine is. A Christmas Carol was a very short book. It was a novella. Let me pull out my facsimile copy. Now even this will be thicker than the original because this has a little bit of extra material in it, but it's much thinner. Yeah, the story has only 166 pages. I've also got some late 19th century copies of some of the later Christmas books that came after A Christmas Carol. They were all bound very similarly and are all about the same length. And look how small and thin these are. Nothing like as big as what we're seeing here. I mean, if you just look at the proportions of his hand on the book, although the page edges are all gilt, so that's good. I guess. I suppose the filmmakers wanted a larger version for filmic purposes, but there's something just so charming and delicate about holding Charles Dickens' Christmas books. And that just looks cumbersome. <laughs> The title page and frontispiece look correct, at least. Dickens did request that the text on the title page would be blue and red. On an earlier trial, it was green and red, actually. And the frontispiece was one of four hand-colored illustrations by John Leach. Oh no. Oh no, 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 no. That typesetting is all wrong. It's the wrong font, it's the wrong spacing. There weren't extra spaces between the paragraphs, and the first line of each paragraph was indented. Uh, the more I look at this, the more I realize that nearly everything is wrong. Oh dear. I mean, this, this isn't a random prop. This entire film is about this one book. Okay, I know I probably sound ridiculously nerdy and nitpicky right now, but here, let me let me just show you what the first page of Stave 1 is supposed to look like. As you can see, the title A Christmas Carol is at the top of page 1, and it as well as the headings Stave 1 and Marley's Ghost are all in capital letters, with rules or lines in between each one. On screen, there is no title at the top, Marley's Ghost is in mixed casing, both upper and lower case, even the first word of the first paragraph should have been in small caps. Oh, and this starts on page four for some reason? I mean, it's not like some books aren't numbered like that where they don't necessarily start on page one, but this book started on page one. Now, you don't see a number one on this page, but there's a number two on the next page. It's even so wrong that the story begins on the left page instead of the right. 
But all that said, there is hilariously one thing they got absolutely right, and only one thing. But it's the one thing I was actually deliberately looking for on this interior shot, because it's an identification point of the first printing. So quite often in publishing, there are little mistakes throughout the book that get missed on the first printing, but are subsequently fixed in later printings. With this book especially, Dickens wrote it in only six weeks, and completely rushed through the printing process in order to get it out in time for Christmas. So when we're looking to identify a first edition first printing and distinguish it from later printings, we look for all these little errors. And on this shot, which is filled with errors. The one thing they got right was the error. So stave one is written with a Roman numeral one, but with the other four staves in the first printing, the numbers were all spelled out. So stave one didn't match the others. In later printings, this was changed to stave O-N-E. With the complete lack of attention to the interior of the book, I'm not even convinced this was an intentional hit on their part. This is like a three out of 10. They got that the book was read, but everything else about the construction of this book is so very, very wrong. And the film is about the book. <sighs> Moving on, next let's take a look at The Queen's Gambit. This is a Netflix series based on the 1983 novel of the same name by Walter Tevis about a young female chess prodigy named Beth Harmon who also grows up struggling with addiction. I have not read the book yet, I just got this after watching the series, but the show takes place starting in mid-1950s America and proceeds into the 1960s. During Beth's rise through the ranks to Grand Master, she studies a few books about chess. The first one she comes across is Modern Chess Openings, a book given to her by Mr. Scheibel, the custodian at her orphanage. This is a real book. It was first published in 1911 by the British chess players Richard Cluin Griffith and John Herbert White. Since then, it's been through 15 different editions and two of them are featured in the series. So there's the, the copy that Mr. Scheibel gives her as a kid, which is the seventh edition, which would be accurate for the time. The seventh edition was published in 1948, and this is the early 1950s, but it's Mr. Scheibel's personal copy that he will have had for a little while. Now, later on, Beth buys her own copy, but naturally the bookstores would be selling the newest edition. In the late 1950s, that would be the ninth edition, which was published in 1957. And of course, being brand new, they correctly include the dust jacket. I have actually tracked down one of these myself, even though I suck at chess, but that's beside the point. And it is absolutely correct to the original. So well done, Netflix, 10 out of 10. Accurate down to the edition and kudos for including the dust jacket. Moving on to Miss Potter. This is a biopic about Beatrix Potter, a writer, illustrator, and conservationist best known for her series of children's books featuring adorable animals such as The Tale of Peter Rabbit. As both a bookseller and a collector, they're incredibly interesting books. Most copies actually contain little to no publication information, so figuring out which edition a Beatrix Potter book is is like a whole puzzle. I myself have two different volumes of bibliographic information to help me identify Beatrix Potter copies. So so since this is a biographical film, the books will be real, but let's see if they're represented accurately. Okay, so the film starts with Beatrix Potter having a meeting with the publishing company F. Warren and Company. Mm -hmm. I've been selling my drawings, oh, yes. greeting cards, place Excellent. cards, etc. for seven oh, years. Never mind. Bunnies and jackets with brass buttons. Unfortunately, the market for children's books... Yes, of course. I, I completely understand. It was silly of me. No experience. If all and company would like to publish your little book, Miss Potter. Okay, no, so Potter was actually rejected by the publishers the first time around, so she had her book, The Tale of Peter Rabbit, privately printed at first in uh, 1901. What happened then was Peter Rabbit was so popular she ended up needing a second printing, again privately published in 1902. She then followed that with a private print run of her second book, The Tailor of Gloucester, also in 1902. And it was at that point that Warren actually agreed to publish her books, and they've been printing them ever since. So I thought for a moment that the manuscript one of the Warren brothers was looking at was this privately printed copy, but it wasn't. They could have so easily replaced that with a private print one, though. Ugh. Book nerd problems. I actually have a facsimile copy of that first private print run. She printed it with only black and white illustrations, except for the frontispiece, which was in color. But the rest were all black and white illustrations, and that was to keep the costs down. She really wanted the books to be affordable, especially for small children. I believe that comes in a conversation later in the film, but anyway. Hi, by Mrs. McGregor. 
Oh, that's fun. This illustration is of Mrs. McGregor and was based on a self-portrait of Potter herself, but this along with three other illustrations were removed in later printings. So that's a little nod to the decision to later remove them. But Flopsy, Mopsy and Cottontail there it had is. bread and milk and blackberries for supper. All right, I'm seeing a lot of great things here. The first trade edition of October 1902 and subsequent early printings of her earlier books were only printed single-sided, so there were blank pages in between each bit of text and illustration throughout. This made Peter Rabbit originally 85 pages long, whereas later editions of the book would only be 56 pages because they could actually print double-sided. The title page has no date, which is correct. Now this changed with some of her later books in which the editions had the year on the title page and then all subsequent reprints were undated, but in this case the date was never printed. Also you can just barely see the end papers there, but those are also correct. In later books Potter drew illustrations for her end papers, which evolved to include more and more of her characters. But for Peter Rabbit, the end papers were a simple pale grey leaf pattern. And then there's the front cover. Now just being around rare books on a day-to-day -day basis, I can instinctively tell that this is a facsimile because they want it, of course, to look hot off the press. But even the best condition copies of this I've seen are not this light a shade of brown. The boards would have been paper covered rather than covered with cloth or leather. Again, Potter was really keen on keeping them affordable, although there were some deluxe editions made as well which were cloth bound. But the standard first trade editions I've seen are a much darker chocolate brown or a dark charcoal gray. But the other details are all correct. There are little dots inside the O's. The publisher just says F. Warren and Co. with nothing after. F. Warren and Co. became a limited company in 1917, so all books of theirs published after that said F. Warren and Co. Limited. Skipping ahead a bit further, this is where Potter actually sees her books in the shop window for the first time. Okay, I know I said this wasn't that big of a deal with Hook, but in this case it is a genuine inaccuracy. There are no dust jackets. I mean, I understand from the standpoint of film aesthetic. Mm, nope, I'm gonna be nitpicky. So this is another case where the books indeed had dust jackets originally. In the case of the Beatrix Potter books, they were wrapped in very delicate glassine dust jackets, which often didn't have much on them aside from the price and maybe an ad for other books by that author or publisher. The copy actually sitting on display may not have been covered, but I would imagine that the copies underneath would definitely have had the dust jackets to protect them. Again, aesthetic wise, I understand why they're not there, but now you know they really should be. Welcome to my nerd brain. I just want to check out the other books in the shop now for a second. The red books to the left of the Peter Rabbits are from the Everyman's Library Collection published by J.M. Dent. I see those all the time. We've got Baby's Own Aesop. It's um, a beautiful little book illustrated by Walter Crane, who's one of the most prolific British illustrators of his time. So this was published in 1887, so this is about 15 years prior. Maybe a little old to be featured in the shop window? I do get the impression that they might have thought, ooh, old, pretty. But at least it did exist in 1902. Ah, the Tale of Two Bad Mice. Either gray or red boards for the first edition, so that's fine. Wait, wait. Okay, so the order of the books is all messed up. The second book she published with Warren was The Tale of Squirrel Nutkin. They skip Squirrel Nutkin. What the heck? After that was The Tailor of Gloucester. The Tale of Two Bad Mice was fifth. But that's not really what's tripping me up here. If we go back to Norman's note, it's dated November 1904, which is in line with Two Bad Mice's publication. But then it shows Two Bad Mice being next to Peter Rabbit and The Tale of Jemima Puddleduck. Jemima wasn't published until 1908. It was the 12th book. <sighs> On the whole, this is a great film. No biopic is ever 100% accurate, but hey, real life doesn't follow a narrative structure anyway. I will give Miss Potter an 8 out of 10. Moving on to The Bookshop. Now this is a fictional story based on the 1978 novel by Penelope Fitzgerald. If you've seen the film Chocolat, this sort of reminds me of that, but with a bookshop in coastal England. I don't know if the film specifies this aside from being the late 1950s, but the book is set in 1959. Here's the lovely Bill Nye playing Mr. Brendish with all his books. Okay, we got some classic penguins. Oh. 
Oh, that's painful to watch. The hilarious thing is that before I got into the book trade, I always used to remove my dust jackets. I never burned them though. I would just sort of tuck them away in the closet. Moral of this video, don't discard your dust jackets. Right, we've got books in the bookshop. Now the film doesn't specify whether this is a new bookshop or secondhand bookshop or a mix. In the book they do talk about how it's mostly new stock, but she also got some residual stock from the bookshop she worked in when she was younger, and some of that did have a few secondhand books mixed in. Oh, hold up. Okay, okay. We gotta talk here. The book that she's holding, that is definitely a Heron book. Heron is a publisher that published these big sets of collected works of classic authors around the 1970s and beyond. By sheer coincidence, I happen to have the set this exact book is from. I'm, I'm about to put it up for sale. Here it is. And this is from the Heron Centennial Edition of the works of Charles Dickens, published in 1970. These collections were bound in a faux leather, and they have some of the gilt decoration to mimic the old fine binding techniques, albeit not nearly as well. So this book belongs in a collection, strike one. Strike two is that it's over a decade off. And strike three is right here where she opens up the book to smell it. I just know from experience that that book in particular will not have that old book smell she's going for. Nope, nothing. Even more egregious is what's below that, still sitting in the box. That, folks, is a Penguin cloth-bound classic. It's A Christmas Carol and Other Writings, published in 2010. It is only one book, I suppose. I'm just gonna move along as if I didn't see that. Here she's packing up some books to send to Mr. Brundish, and she's chosen Fahrenheit 451. This is the first hardcover edition. But that edition was first released in the US. The first UK edition was only published the next year in 1954, and it looked like this. Seeing as this is supposed to be 1959, or at least the later half of the 1950s, it doesn't make much sense to have the US edition. The UK would have sold, well, the UK edition. I also see in there That Uncertain Feeling by Kingsley Amish. That is a Foursquare book published in 1960. A little early, but okay. Like I said, the film doesn't specify a year, so I guess we have some wiggle room. And now on to the central book of the story, Lolita by Vladimir Nabokov. She says that this book has just come out, which makes me think the film is actually set in 1955. Lolita was originally published in France by Olympia Press, a Parisian publisher which normally published erotic and avant-garde fiction, but it was the only publisher willing to take on Lolita. The first edition was published in two volumes using the standard green covers that all Olympia Press books use. Now, when this was published in the UK, it was as a single hardback volume, but that was in 1959. So again, depending on when this film is actually meant to be set, it is feasible that she would have had to order the two volume French edition if the UK edition wasn't out yet. That said, I'm now seeing a pattern. This book, Dandelion Wine, is another A. Bradbury book and is again a first edition, but the first US edition rather than the UK edition. Both were released in 1957, so there's no reason not to use the correct edition if we're going for accuracy. I get the impression though that when deciding to feature first editions, the filmmakers opted for the more recognizable covers, the true first editions if you will, rather than what would have more likely been sold in a small English town in the 1950s. I will give a pass to Lolita, however, as the novel does mention this specifically being the two volume edition in green covers, so at least in this case the film is following the novel. Oh, now she's soaking in her bookshop for the last time. Oh my god. More cloth-bound classics. This is this is perhaps my biggest pet peeve because there's this idea that any book covered in cloth that looks pretty is automatically vintage looking. And with something this identifiable to modern readers, these are currently in bookstores like everywhere. You can't just pass them off as old books. Those were published in the 2000s. This is supposed to be the 1950s. I mean, if you're going to be lazy with the background set decoration, don't do a close-up. So the dark one with the gold chandeliers, that's Great Expectations, published in 2008. 
The dark blue one with light blue waves, that's The Odyssey, also published in 2008. White with black clocks, that's Oliver Twist, 2009. The purple one with the bird cages, that's Bleak House, 2011. And the green one with the horses, that's Hard Times, also 2011. I'm sorry, but this movie fails purely by including these. Yes, they're designed to slightly evoke the romance of that old-fashioned bookbinding, but in a very modern way. Ah, <sighs> breathe. This is a film about books. I'm going to move on. Another favorite from my childhood, Ever After. This is a live action retelling of Cinderella starring Drew Barrymore and Angelica Houston purporting to be the true story that inspired the fairy tale. Not sure exactly what year this is meant to be. I know it's early 1500s because at one point the prince talks about bringing his father into the 16th century. And Leonardo da Vinci is a character in this. Yes, I shall go down in history as the man who opened a door. So it'll have to be during his lifetime. He died in 1519. And these scenes with little eight-year-old Danielle occur 10 years before we meet the older Danielle, as per the voiceover. So we're somewhere in the first decade of the 16th century. So Danielle's father has just brought her a copy of Thomas More's Utopia. Utopia was first published in 1516, so that's problematic. Although it also really depends on which language they're reading in. Utopia was originally published in Latin. It's possible that Danielle and her father could read Latin? Obviously the film is in English, but it's set in France. Let's assume it's more likely they'd be reading it in French. The first translation of Utopia was to Italian in 1548, with a French translation following in 1550, and finally an English translation in 1551. So if any of these are options, they're way off. Well, since we're here anyway, let's uh, check out the binding. Disclaimer, I am not an expert on 16th century bindings, but I have seen enough of them to have a vague idea of what they should look like. Now, at first glance, I thought this was maybe bound in vellum due to the color, but looking more closely, it actually looks like parchment binding. Vellum is just a specific type of parchment. They're both made from animal skins, but vellum is specifically made from calf skin and is just a finer quality. But yes, it looks like the boards are wrapped in parchment and the spine is held together with probably leather lacing, which you can see poking out into the parchment covering the joints, which is possible for a 16th century French binding as far as I know. Ooh, I've just found some photos of a 1629 edition of Utopia in Latin. This is a century later than when the film is meant to take place, but at least it gives you an idea of what was possible back then. And this one is in fact bound in vellum. What jumps out the most to me in the film version as not very accurate is the big gilt title on the front cover. I haven't seen any examples of parchment casing where the title is written on the front board. It's usually on the spine and certainly if it were on the front board it wouldn't be so bold and thick. Now we've jumped ahead 10 years to when we see the adult Danielle asleep with the book resting on top of her by the cinders. Clearly she's been reading it a lot and not taking the best care of it. It's a shame really, it's clearly a super rare advanced copy. Well, in any case, the giant title on the front board is clearly being used as a film device, so we the audience can instantly recognize the book and understand its significance. To be honest, I'm not really mad at it. I still love this film. <gasps> Ooh, more books. I like that you see the monks at the top because libraries like this would likely be held by monks at the time. Lots of light colors, so mostly vellum or parchment bindings. All right, one last scene. Embrace yourselves, this scene is painful. Get away from me, so help me go! No! Marguerite, don't! No! 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 Alright, before I wrap up this video, I've got one more for you, but this is sort of an honorable mention. The Mummy, and also The Mummy Returns. The Book of the Dead gives life. And the Book of the Living takes life away. I am not at all an expert on Egyptian history, but I have enjoyed this video with Rachel Maxey and actual Egyptologist Dr. Carlene Darnell. And in this video, they discuss the Book of the Dead and the Book of Amun-Ra props. Book of the Dead. Yes. <laughs> the ancient Egyptians called it the book or scroll, more properly, of going forth by day. What he is holding, what we think of as a book, is actually called a codex. When they say Book of the Dead, it's a scroll. 
Of course, this is a fantastical fictional story, so we're not necessarily going for accuracy here. But I was still curious to see if there is any merit to these props at all. It turns out that the original props were recently auctioned off, and the listings had some really high quality photos of not just the covers, but the internal pages as well. So I reached out to Colleen over Instagram, and I sent her a link to the photos from the auction to get her opinion on the legitimacy of the hieroglyphs. And it turns out, yeah, there, there's not much to them. According to Colleen, the hieroglyphs were a bit jumbled in places, and there seemed to be repetitions of a few basic groups, some making no clear sense at all. The large cartouche on the cover is even wonkier, she said, although she could make out the words for venerated and before the great god. Alas, she told me, no one seems really to have tried to make this really say anything, certainly no clear copies of texts from the Book of the Dead, still rather nifty props. Oh well. That's all for today. If you have any other films or series featuring books that you'd like me to react to, let me know in the comments. I do have some other somewhat related videos planned dealing with books that are featured on screen, so if that sounds interesting to you, you can uh, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell to get notifications, and join our squirrely nerdy bookish community. Until next time, be kind, be curious, and be effective. Bye! Another special, another special request, another, another special, now during Beth's rise through the right, now during Beth's rise through, a few books about chess. Why can't I say that? <laughs>